Welcome back. This is part 2 of my DC Animated Universe reviews. The universe consists of many shows based on DC Comics that all intertwine and are based in one universe. It was created by Bruce Timm who is a genius. I already talked to you about Batman the Animated Series. Now I'm going to talk to you about the second show, Superman the Animated Series. And I'm also going to talk about the movie that was based on the series called Brainiac Attacks. The show consists of three seasons, one in three having 13 episodes, and season two has 28 episodes. It takes place in a sort of future past. Unlike Batman the Animated Series, which was always taking place at night, Superman's world is a lot lighter, and most of the stories take place during the day. And because Superman is an alien and has superpowers, it allows the writers to really go beyond just criminals in a city. You can go into space, take place on different planets, and have more science fiction things rather than just having it grounded in reality the way Batman the Animated Series was. So the stories are much more out there than Batman. In Batman, the show just jumped right into the story, already having the characters established. But here we have an origin story that was a three-parter called The Last on a Krypton. Obviously, the story has been done a hundred times in other shows and movies. So it could have been very boring and seemed too familiar, but they did a good job adapting it and making it different while still staying true to the comics. In part one, we follow his parents on Krypton and his father predicts the end of the world, but no one believes him. So he sends his son Kal-El to Earth where he could be safe from the world exploding. One change that I really liked was that they made Brainiac, one of Superman's greatest villains, be from Krypton. Brainiac makes it so Superman's father, Jor-El's prediction of the end of the world is not valid because Brainiac, the computer that runs all of Krypton, says it's not, but really he was trying to save himself. He collected the data of the planet and got out at the same time as Kal-El. In part 2 we see him grow up on Smallville as Clark Kent, being raised by the good natured people Martha and Jonathan Kent and we see him learn about his powers and his origin on Krypton. Another thing that they changed was that Clark's adopted father Jonathan Kent did not die, which is one thing I didn't really like. I feel like that was one of the things that made Clark the man he is today, and was a big part of why he put on the suit to become Superman. And I know they were trying to tone it down for younger audiences, but Batman's parents are dead in Batman the Animated Series, Ben Parker is dead in Spider-Man the Animated Series, so you can't say that people haven't done this in kid shows before. So I just wish they could have at least implied his death even if they didn't show it. In parts 2 and 3, we're introduced to the main characters of the show. There are a lot more than there were in Batman the Animated Series. Obviously we have Superman or Clark Kent. He's always a good person and believes in doing the right thing. As Superman, he uses his powers for good and would be willing to sacrifice himself to save others, just like in the comics. As Clark Kent, which is his real disguise, he acts awkward and nervous, but still is a stand-up guy. He's voiced by Tim Daly, who does a great job. He uses different monotones of his voice when he's playing the two, and is just perfect for the role. Superman in the series is much weaker than he was in the comics. The writer said in this show, he could probably be killed without Kryptonite, which is his one weakness. And at first, I was kind of disappointed about that. But then I thought about it, and it would honestly just be boring if he had all the powers he had in the comics. He could take care of the episode's threat in two minutes. And what kind of show would that be? A boring one. That's what it would be. Now the supporting characters. As I said before, we have the Kents, who appear multiple times in the series, but not as much as the other characters. The people that work at the Daily Planet are the classic characters from the comics. Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, and Perry White. Lois Lane is handled very well. She's strong-willed, bossy, and has a relationship with her job. Clark and Lois' relationship is handled differently than most of the Superman stories. Clark doesn't take as much of an interest in her as Clark or Superman as he did in other comics. Although there still is a spark there, but it's not until the very end of the series that Lois and Superman finally get together. Although there isn't a running gag of Superman always saving Lois, it happens in pretty much every episode Lois is in. Clark and Lois are more like competitors, always trying to knock each other off the byline for the paper of the Daily Planet where they work. They're still friends, but less so than they were in other stories, which I thought was a good twist because it made the show more original. Jimmy Olsen, the friend and photographer of Clark, is less nerdy than he is in the comics. He doesn't have the bow tie or anything. He's made to be more modern with the hair and the baggy pants but he's still the same goofy red-headed photographer that we all love. So I thought they did a good job adapting him to the modern times and making him more original, but still staying true to the original content. Perry White is pretty much exactly how he is in the comics. 
He shouts a lot and encourages employees to compete for the byline. Another character is Dr. Emile Hamilton, who helps Superman by making him space or lead suits to make him breathe in space or to shield him from kryptonite. He also conducted some experiments in space and helped Superman answer some science questions that would help him later on in battle. Now, my favorite supporting characters are Dan Turpin and Maggie Sawyer. They both work for Metropolis PD and they're sort of like Batman's Commissioner Gordon. The two have a great relationship. Turpin is the hot-headed cop who is implied to be a cop who was working in tough streets in New York and slowly made his way to the top for the Metropolis Task Force. They both care for each other, which you can see each time one of them gets hurt on the field. Turpin's relationship with Superman is also really well done. At first, he gets mad and he dislikes Superman because he's too proud to accept the help from him. But throughout the series, he learns to accept Superman's help. They save each other a few times and ultimately, they become good friends and partners. Looks to me like Superman saved your skin again. Other way around. If it wasn't for Dan Turpin, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. Thanks. Anytime, pal. Now, for the villains. One thing that I love about the DC Animated Universe is that they give each of their villains a backstory and origins to their characters. They even make new villains that are so well executed in the show that they end up to be canon in the real comics. Batman the Animated Series did that with Harley Quinn, who is one of my favorite characters in DC, another villain named Lockup. In Superman, one villain they came up with was Livewire. She started out as an obnoxious radio caster who bashed on Superman. And then she was too stupid to listen to Superman to not have an outdoor event during a lightning storm, and she was electrified and is now able to take power from electricity. They picked the perfect voice actor for her. She's played by Lori Petty, and she has the perfect annoying obnoxious voice. Another villain they made up for the show was Luminous, who I thought was pretty cool. He had two episodes that really focused on him. The first episode was called Target. He's trying to kill Lois, but does it quietly and acts as her friend. And it turns out to be a sort of mystery story until Lois figures it out. Such a clever girl. In the second episode called Solar Power, he's no longer hiding. He's out in the open and has a new suit and all, which I really like by the way. He's able to make illusions with light duplicate himself and do all kinds of different things they give him a one-up on superman maybe this is the real me but then again maybe it's me or me the last villain they met up for the show was volcana she can produce and control fire i really love her character because she's not just an evil person like many of the other villains are but she was manipulated and taken advantage of by an ex-government agent it made her more of a tragic character and in the end, she ends up teaming up with Superman. At the end of the episode, Superman sees that she's not a bad person, and instead of taking her to prison, he takes her to her own island of paradise. Now, the villains taken from the comics. The two main characters are Brainiac and Lex Luthor. Brainiac is interesting here, as I said before, because he and Superman are the last surviving memories of Krypton. It's also interesting because Brainiac is not only Superman's enemy, but is also his father jor enemy. You are your father's son, Kal-El. Headstrong, foolish, easily defeated, and ultimately forgotten. Lex Luthor is probably my favorite villain of the show, and I think a big part of that is because of the voice actor, Clancy Brown. He's the Kevin Conroy of Lex Luthor. No one can play him better. He actually auditioned for the role of Superman, but as soon as Bruce Timm heard his voice, he said, you got the job for Lex. His voice is just so menacing, and the way he delivers his lines is exactly what you want from Lex. They changed his character a little bit from the comics. They made him less of an evil, goofy scientist and more of a cold-hearted businessman. I really like that change and prefer it to the more goofy, evil genius. In the beginning of the show, Lex pretty much runs Metropolis. My technology built it, my will keeps it going, and nearly two-thirds of its people work for me whether they know it or not. So now when Superman comes along, he sees him as a pest he could get in his way. I also love his office. The building is a giant L, and he's on the top floor in a wide open office with shark tanks covering the walls. I just think it represents Lex's ego and personality perfectly. Lex is a personal bodyguard that was made for the show, and has also made her way into the comics. She's completely dedicated to Lex, and we even get some character development and find out she was alone on the streets until Lex took her in. Why are you willing to risk your life for Luthor? What does he have on you? Nothing. Before I met him, I was living on the streets, like a stray dog. He took me in, 
made me what I am. Another great villain is Bizarro. They had an origin episode for him in an episode called Identity Crisis. The beginning of the episode was really well done. Clark and Lois are investigating a story when Clark falls off a cliff and is caught by Superman. It's a great twist and starts the episode off perfectly. Later on, we see that the clone of Superman, who was created by Lex, deteriorate and become Bizarro. He's another tragic character, and it's probably much more tragic than any other character I can think of in the DC Animated Universe. His brain gets messed up as he deteriorates, making him dumb, and end up leading him to make bad choices. He's a sad, lonely, confused misfit trying to understand who he is. He's not really portrayed as a villain, but more as a problem that has to be taken care of. He doesn't mean to cause harm. In fact, he thinks he's doing something good, which makes it even more tragic. Tim Daly, the voice of Superman, also does the voice of Bizarro, and he does a phenomenal job. He went to town on this, and in my opinion, is up there with Mark Hamill's voicing the Joker. Superman! Me, I'm happy to see you. Toy Man is another well-executed character. In the comics, he's just an odd guy with an obsession with toys. But here they made him much creepier. His design is just outstanding. It's so creepy, and to have him be inside a toy makes him even more of a psycho because he wants to become his favorite thing in the world, a toy. He even has an obsession with the model, and he stalks her in the episode called Obsession. This is another example of a character blossoming because of a great voice actor. He's voiced by Bud Court, and he does an outstanding job to make this already creepy character even creepier. Oh, Darcy, Darcy, so beautiful. Soon you'll be all mine. There are many other great villains like Metallo, Parasite, Weather Wizard, Mr. Mixelpick, and Lobo. One thing I was really disappointed about was they didn't have Doomsday, who is Superman's bane. In the comics, Doomsday killed Superman and is one of the best villains in all of DC. So why didn't they put him in here? Later he made an appearance in Justice League, but I still would have wanted him to be in Superman's own show because he's one of Superman's greatest villains. Superman the Animated Series was the first time that we really got a glimpse that all of these shows were going to be connected. The first mention of another DC character was in the very first episode where Martha Kent mentions Batman. I don't want anyone thinking you're like that nut in Gotham City. But the first time we really got to see two DC characters side by side was in the episode called Speed Demons. This was a great episode. We meet the Flash for the first time, who would later on play a big part in this universe, being part of the original seven members of the Justice League. Superman and Flash race to see who's faster, which is a highly debated topic with us comic book nerds. Hey, we never did settle who's the fastest man alive. No, we never did. The great thing is that they never answer the question, leaving the topic still a mystery. Later on in season two, we get a three-part story arc called World's Finest. Here, Superman the Animated Series and Batman the Animated Series merge together. This is probably my favorite part of the whole series. The Joker and Lex Luthor team up to kill Superman. Then Batman and Superman meet each other for the first time. At first they don't like each other, and they use their special talents to figure out each other's secret identities, which I thought was really cool. Later they team up to stop Lex and the Joker. Harley Quinn is also in it, and even gets to fight Lex's bodyguard, Mercy. There were a couple other Superman-Batman crossovers. One was where Bruce went missing, and Superman and Tim Drake, or Robin, team up. Superman dressed as Batman, which is hilarious. The sooner we find your boss, the better. Right side. And it's awesome to see him beat the crap out of Bane. In the final crossover between Superman and Batman, we see Ra's al Ghul and his daughter Talia Ghul, which was probably the weakest of the Batman-Superman crossovers, but it was still pretty good. Some other DC characters that made appearances were Kyle Rayner as Green Lantern, Aquaman, Doctor Fate, and Orion. For Kyle Rayner, they basically just took Hal Jordan's backstory and mixed it with Kyle's character, which I'm perfectly fine with. I actually kind of prefer it. I was never really a fan of Hal Jordan, and I've always loved Kyle, so I was kind of disappointed when they decided to go with Jon Stewart as the Green Lantern in Justice League, since they had already established Kyle. But at least they didn't go with Hal Jordan. The episode Kyle was in was called In Brightest Day, which is the beginning of the Green Lantern Oath. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light. Sinestro makes an appearance in this episode, and one thing cool about this episode is that on one of the planes that Kyle gets thrown into by Sinestro, it says Hal Jordan, 
who's a pilot. So obviously that's his plane. I just thought that was cool they threw that in there. The episode with Aquaman was called A Fish Story. I really love Aquaman, so I was really upset when they decided to go with Hawkgirl instead of him for the Justice League series. And then when they did put him in, they gave him a whole redesign. I would have preferred that they stuck with the original design from this episode. This episode was really interesting because even though Aquaman is good, we see he has a different rulebook than Superman and threatens to start a war with humans, or surface dwellers as he calls them. Dr. Fate appeared in an episode called The Hand of Fate. He would also later play a big part in the DC animated universe, being a part of Justice League. And I liked him a lot in Justice League, and I think a big contributor to that was how he was developed in this episode. We see him struggle with deciding whether or not to put the helmet back on, and Superman's determination to help those in need rubs off on Fate, and he decides to return. Orion appeared in the end of Season 2. Season 2's final four episodes really delivered. There were two two-parters. The first one was called Apocalypse Now. We learn the story of Apocalypse and New Genesis and learn about how Orion and Calabac were switched by the two leaders of the planets as a peace treaty. This was probably the most intense story of the series. The skies are no longer bright and blue, but they're dark and dull. Now here's a spoiler for the end of the episode, so if you don't want to know, please skip ahead a little bit. In the end, Dan Turpin is killed. This is the first time somebody was actually killed in the DC Animated Universe. Even expendable villains didn't die. Every time a plane would blow up or something, they would always show a shot to show that they were still okay. So this was a huge shock for fans. It's even sadder because he was developed a whole lot more, leading his troops against the apocalypse monsters, getting closer to Maggie, who was in the hospital at this time, and building up his partnership with Superman. The reaction from everybody when it happens is so powerful, and Superman's reaction really shows a different side to him. <laughs> For the season 2 finale, they introduce Supergirl. I really like her character and think it adds more to Clark's character to have the responsibility to take care of her. Supergirl represents the youth of our country in my opinion. She's pretty stubborn, she always wants to hurry, and always wants to dream bigger and get away from Smallville. She's tired of Smallville and wants to go to Metropolis and fight next to Clark as Superman. And eventually she does. I've gotta say, I hate her Supergirl costume. I don't like the white sweater and I absolutely hate the gloves. Later on in Justice League Unlimited, they did change her suit to look more like Superman's, which looks a whole lot better. In the finale, we meet Granny Goodness. The execution of her character was horrible. I think it was one of the worst things that ever happened in the DC Animated Universe. She's voiced terribly by a man. She doesn't pose a threat and is rather just straight up annoying. She is by far my least favorite character in the DC Animated Universe. She's just so pointless and annoying. Children, defend your granny's honor. But other than that, the season 2 finale was very good. We have yet another great origin story, this time for Supergirl. Now, some other great episodes that I didn't mention yet. The Late Mr. Kent was a good one. This is sort of like an old detective story. There's a voiceover by Clark explaining how we got to this point, which is where the episode started. He's looking at Clark Kent's funeral as Superman. We must not forget the good times and the warm feelings we have for a colleague and a friend named Clark Kent. He has to struggle with not only making sure that an innocent man that isn't sentenced to death, but also has to figure out how to bring Clark Kent back from the dead. It's a really interesting and well-written story. Another episode that I really liked was called Superman's Pal. Jimmy Olsen is on the news saying that he's friends with Superman, so some people go after him. It sort of reminds me of the episode of Batman the Animated Series called The Man Who Killed Batman, where a guy supposedly killed Batman, and so all the villains go after him to prove that they could kill the man who killed Batman. Now the worst episode of the series, Unity. It was towards the end of the series in the late season 3. This is the grossest episode you will ever see. All of Smallville becomes one with an alien and have these gross tentacles coming out of their mouths trying to get more people to become one with this alien. What have you done to them? You made them one with a greater power. The series finale was a two part story called Legacy. This was a very interesting story. It starts out with us following a warrior from Apocalypse who is easily defeating his enemy. Then he goes to bow to Lord Darkseid, and he takes off his helmet to reveal it's Superman. Granny Goodness brainwashed him to make him think that instead of his ship landing on Earth, it landed on Apocalypse, and he was raised by Granny and Darkseid instead of the Kents. 
He then is sent to Earth to conquer it. Earth is of course thrown off guard because this is their savior doing all these terrible things to them. There's a cool fight between Superman and Supergirl, and in the end there's an epic battle between Superman and Darkseid. The ending is kind of depressing. Earth is scared of him, and his friends are scared of him, and they don't trust him anymore. Did you see the look on Hamilton's face? He'll never trust me again. The only person that really stays on his side is Lois. The last shot of the series is a zoom out of Superman and Lois finally kissing after three seasons, which was a fitting end. The series was supposed to go on for another season, where Earth would learn to trust him again, but it didn't get picked up for season 4. But I actually like the ending now. It ties in really well with the Justice League series, and makes for some very interesting stories like the Cadmus arc. There was a spin-off movie called Superman Brainiac Attacks. It was based on the series, but is not canon with the DC Animated Universe. Bruce Tim was not involved in this one. He said he was done once Justice League Unlimited ended. This movie came out one month after that in June 2006. It's all the same animation as the original Superman show and has a lot of the same voice actors. Tim Daly returns which is a treat because he had not voiced Superman since the animated series because he was tied up in other projects when they asked him to do Justice League. So that was pretty exciting. Donna Delaney, David Kaufman, George Zunza, Shelby Faberis, and Mike Farrell all return as Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, Perry White, and Jonathan Martha Kent. But unfortunately, Clancy Brown didn't return as Lex Luthor. They also made Lex much more goofy and silly, more like the Gene Hackman performance in the original Superman movie from 1978. I guess they thought no one could do the Lex that Brown did, so they went in a complete opposite direction for his character. The person who replaced him was Powers Booth. He did a pretty good job, but he's no Clancy Brown. It's not the Lex Luthor we were hoping for, but this Lex is actually pretty funny. Rooting for you, my man. Corey Burton, who played Brainiac in the series, did not return either. His replacement was Lance Henriksen, and he actually did a pretty good job, maybe even as good as Burton's performance. The story was very inconsistent with the series in my opinion. It focuses much more on relationships than the series did, and that's one of the things I liked about the series. It wasn't loaded with couple drama. But here, that's pretty much all there is. Clark struggles with telling Lois that he's Clark Kent and Superman. His reason for not telling her is that it would put her in danger. But the world already knows that Superman and Lois have a relationship, so she's already in extreme danger from that. What could it hurt if she knows Superman is also Clark Kent? I don't think it would do anything, because Clark doesn't have any enemies. Superman does, and everybody already knows that Lois and Superman are together. So, it just doesn't make any sense. Then they focus on Jimmy's love life. Out of nowhere, he says he has a crush on Lex's bodyguard, Mercy, which seems a little out there. Then there's another girl that likes him at the planet, but he's too busy drooling over Mercy to notice her. You see what I mean about the film being dominated by couple drama? I just didn't really care for it. The villains of the movie are Lex and Brainiac. They meet for the first time and decide to team up. I guess they're completely ignoring when they met in Superman the Animated Series, and when their bodies were formed together to make one in Justice League. You would think they would remember being fused together. Another huge plot hole. One small thing that I actually liked in the ending was when they mentioned the episode Superman's Pal. You might say I'm Superman's Pal. Actually, I believe that honor belongs to Jimmy Olsen of the planet. The ending had a fight between Superman and Brainiac. It goes on for so long that it honestly just becomes boring. The movie is not that good and is nowhere near the standards of the regular DC Animated Universe. I guess I just can't do it without Bruce Timm behind it. Despite this crappy movie, the series is probably the best Superman animated show to his date. It still stands the test of time after 18 years. Well, this is only the second show of the universe and we still have four more parts to go. Stay tuned for part 3 where I review Batman Beyond.